Hi everybody, welcome to this week's question and answer video. My name is David, this channel is Demar's Coaching. I'm answering your guys' questions from the last week's question and answer video. I do this every single Monday. Please go down below in the comment section this week. Ask me anything you want. Come back next Monday for my answer and let me know what you think. If I missed your question, I'm sorry. I if, if I don't bring it up here, then I answer it in the comment section. I got a ton of questions that I can't fit all in today's video. Feel free to keep asking me. Please ask me again if I miss it entirely. It's not on purpose. And ask me again if I misunderstand your question or you don't understand my answer. Keep it, keep it going until you understand, okay? Until I can help you if I can. Um, this is my second time doing this video. Something happened with my computer and I had to start all over. Not fun to do it twice. Okay. There, there's so many questions and they're so long. I can't read them all. So I get right to the question. Okay. I read them already myself. I think all of them. I'm going to get to the question. First one is from Joan in New York. Hello, Joan. No, I'm going to get there in a second. I'm going to jo do Joan's like fourth. Sorry. I'm a little disorganized because the video stopped. Um, ask a, or tell us your locations to people. Thank you. When you want to ask a question or anytime, pop in and say, hi, here from Australia. Sorry, Australia. Okay, Doug, Lagos, Portugal. Hi, Doug. Thanks for all you do. You're welcome. Thank you. Do you think at some point binge watching YouTube videos from various teachers, psychologists regarding cluster B relationships and dynamics can be detrimental to personal mental health? It's probably not. Yeah, I mean, eventually. Yeah. I mean, it, it, all that matters, Doug, is how it's making you feel. The, the fact that you're asking me sounds like you have a problem with it. Maybe you should cut back. You see, when we have loss, we have a void. Somebody took up space and time in your life. Toxic people, all of it. And now they're gone. We have a big space to fill. A lot of space and time. Let's try to fill that with something healthy. A lot of people use working out. I suggest a interest of yours. Pursue an interest. Some hobby, something you wanted to learn, something you want to see, do. Stuff like that. Okay? Not people. We don't replace people with people. Um, and, you know, th there's a certain amount of help we all need. Everyone out there. There's a certain amount of help that you need. And if you don't get all of that help, it's damaging. I don't know how to express that anymore. So if your help chart is like this, only getting this much help can be very damaging. Not getting this help and just watching videos can be extremely damaging. Yeah, there's a lot that needs to be done to recover, to heal from something so complex and so traumatic. It's, it's, it, I promise you, we don't heal just by watching videos. I wish we did. We can be validated. We can learn a lot of information. We can learn a little bit about our experience and the people and stuff like this, but we still have to heal, feel better about our emotions and stuff like this. We need to share that, express it, talk, write, things like that. Okay, Doug? Um, that's up to you if you feel like it's not serving you any longer and maybe even being not healthy for you. Try cutting back and see what happens. Try replacing that void with something else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very common question people ask me a lot over the years. And Dan from Nebraska. Hello, Dan. I just don't understand the BPD pendulum swing. It's hard to get past someone suddenly ripping you to pieces, then drawing you back in. Always your fault too, whatever reasons they come up with them because they can't look at themselves. I, I, I have someone in my life. They're gone. I'm left with myself. This is when we introspect. This is when we're critical. This, this is when it hurts. That's what situational depression is after a relationship. We're depressed because we don't like ourselves very much right now. People that carry enough shame, hate themselves enough, can't look at themselves at all. Remember, that's why I don't apologize. That's why I don't change behaviors. And that's why I can't grieve. Your partners aren't just happy moving along with someone else and everything's great now. I know they act like it. I know they want you to believe that and everyone else, but they cannot grieve. They don't just get over it. A psychopath, sociopath, they're only people that can possibly just walk away and not care at all. Borderlines, narcissists, can't handle it. 
They can't handle themselves. They can't handle relationships. They can't handle loss. Okay. So that makes them look at themselves and how they respond to that is how they feel about themselves. So when you guys break up, that's why they're so mean and vicious because they hate themselves. That's why they quickly go find someone else. So they don't look at themselves and they do not heal. They do not recover. They do not grieve. That's why they contact you later. That's why they try to get you back in their life. That's why they keep talking about you to other people or smear you. Okay, um, that pendulum swing is splitting. Someone who's reliant on people, needs them, and someone that can't protect themselves. So I can't take care of myself, I can't make myself feel better, I can't give myself what I need and reassure myself and things like this. I am reliant on people to do that, but also I can't protect myself from these people. So it's like, it's like, you know, it's like coming in and trying to get what I need from you before you hurt me. But I have to always get what I need from you. And if I can, I better get somebody else to give that to me. So I'm always looking for danger all the time, all the time. Their cognitive functioning does not function properly. They take in all the information. This is what we do. Cognitively, we take in information from touch, from hearing, from our eyes, from our nose, from our mouth, everything. And we process that information and come back with an answer. They do not process the information correctly. That's why they feel slighted when you didn't do anything to them. That's why they tell you what happened yesterday isn't what happened yesterday. It's their brains and it's more than hypervigilance. More than that. If they just didn't need you so badly, then they just stay away from you. Problem solved. But they need you badly. They can't be alone for a day. They hate themselves. It hurts too much to look at me. So I either need you back or somebody else. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't work. That's not grieving. Okay? That pendulum, that up and down un unstableness is what causes the dependency in the relationship. Just like drugs, high and come down, drunk and hungover, gamble and lose, you know, build up sex and climax, all these things. Up and down, up and down is what causes the dependency. It's, it's very unstable. It's very dangerous. It's very toxic. It's very unhealthy. And it makes us lose a sense of who we are. Nicola from, uh, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Nicola, Nicola. Let me know if you can. I'm saying Nicola. Is that right? Or is it Nicola? From the United Kingdom. Just wanted to say great Q&A this week. A lot of information, also validation of things. Us exes of BP partners experience my add on to the list you asked was that they purposely sabotage any event you have planned with or without them. Parties, trips, celebrations. Yes, they do. Remember, they can't handle stress. They can't handle the stress of being alone and they get into relationships and they can't handle the stress in the relationship they had with you. Once they have to be responsible for something, they can't handle that. Once they are held accountable for something, they can't handle that. Their fears and phobias kick in. You might leave me, you might cheat on me, you might hate me, you might reject me. I don't want to commit to you, I'm scared. All of that. They can't handle it. And so these toxic behaviors surface in time. A lot of mental illness you can see right away. Schizophrenia, you can see them talking to themselves. Yeah. Personality disorders surfaces in relationships. So on the, on the surface, meet and greet. They're great. They're charming. They're so nice and sweet, loving, polite. That's easy, guys. Come on. Expect more than that. Have higher standards than that. But they can't handle parties, birthdays, celebrations, things like this. It does cause a little more stress, doesn't it, guys? I mean, that, that causes a little bit more stress chemicals and anxiety than just sitting around all day on Sunday and watching TV together, doing nothing, right? Oh, we're planning for a party. We have to plan for it. We have to pay for it. We have to communicate, make sure people are there and make sure everything goes okay. It gets a little more stressful. We can handle that. We look forward to it. We enjoy it. We enjoy emotional connection with people and celebrating life. They don't. They don't. And so it causes, it causes more stress for them and they ruin it. That's the reaction to stress. Hope that makes sense. Now here's Joan from New York. Hi, Joan. Thank you for answering some questions for me in the past. You are welcome. And this, the time I spend making these videos, it's a relief to have somewhere to go to be understood. I was hoping you can speak a bit 
about how emotional abuse can affect the nervous system. So here's my quick little lesson on that. And I just explained this like 10 minutes ago. Our nervous system is made up of our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system. These work together to protect us. And so when we have a fear, a danger, stress, we fight or flight. We eliminate the stress or we get away from it, but we have to eliminate the stress and not live with it. That's how it works. And our parents teach us to do that by when we're stressed, uh, they pick us up and calm us down. So we're never in the stress much. We have it and we learn how to deal with it by eliminating it or getting away from it. Our parents keep doing that and doing that and doing that. And then we start doing that and doing that. The problem with childhood neglect and abuse is we sit in the stress for a long time, years. So the stress chemicals, there's several. The, the biggest ones we know, adrenaline and cortisol. There's a few others. They're released to make us fight the threat, danger, stress. It, it makes us stronger, if that's what we need it for. But it makes us stronger, it makes us faster and quicker, it makes us think faster. Better attention, better memory, better focus. Eyes work better, ears, nose, mouth, everything, all our senses work really, really good. I mean, it works really well. Yeah, Go ask a, a, an athlete in the Olympics. They get so much stress chemicals, they can perform really better on just that day, just a little bit better than others. They might get so nervous they make a mistake because they're so stressed. But it really, really works. But over time, if we don't eliminate the threat and have the fuel, oh, by the way, I don't think I said that yet. I said it last time, not yet, here. We have the stress chemicals that makes us faster, quicker, stronger, attention, all that. We eliminate the threat and then the feel-good hormones come and make us feel better. Feel-good hormones, there's four major ones. We call them our DOSE. It's an acronym for dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. These are things we feel when we're happy, when we're excited, when we climax, when we're emotionally connected with people, petting our pets. And we get the stress chemicals, limited to danger, the danger, they go away, the feel-good hormones come and calm us down, make us feel comfortable again. That's how it works together. In childhood, we can't get away from the stress. We can't stand up to our parents and make the stress go away or just walk out the house. We're stuck in it. And this is what trauma is. This is what complex post-traumatic stress disorder is. Feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. If you feel like that, you're being traumatized. I can't make it stop. It's too much. I don't know what to do. And so over time, these stress chemicals that makes everything work better now makes everything work worse. We get fatigue. I'm not as strong. I can't sleep well, can't eat well. My attention span is worse. My focus, my memory. Children develop ADHD. Now we know that's what it's from. ADD, ADHD is from neglect. It's from stress in childhood, prolonged over time. We, we get autoimmune disease. Now we know that that's what causes it. Literally killing ourselves, attacking ourselves, stress. It's the number one cause of cancer, disease. Thank God children can fight that more. But if you don't fix that and you go into adulthood with this kind of stress and relationships, you're more susceptible to disease. You will die sooner. It's killing you. You're literally killing children by not giving them what they need. That's why emotional needs are the most important thing in our life, more than physical. It causes depression, it causes all anxiety, that people have an adulthood, anxiety problems, all caused from childhood neglect. We've known this for decades. When I say that we recently discovered this or discovered that, it's sad we already knew that. People in the 60s knew it. I watched studies that prove it in the 60s, 50s. Don't know what happened. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. I hope I explained it well. Ask me more if you want to, thank you. Wendy in Montreal. Hello, Wendy. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. This question may be worth looking into. You're welcome. Have you ever heard of Kahn's syndrome? It's primary hyperaldosteronism. Do, 
to oh hyperaldosteronism hyperaldosteronism what was saying right this is due to an adrenal tumor no i have not heard much about adrenal tumors being hyper too much um it has been correlated with mental health symptoms such as hypervigilance, anxiety, panic attack, fight, flight response. Recent studies attempt to correlate formation of these tumors with persistent early childhood trauma. Well, we already know what causes tumors. Stress. And guess where it's located? Where our stress chemicals are. Our adrenal glands are on our kidneys. A lot of people get back problems when they're stressed. Financial problems, they say, biggest symptom, back. Interesting, huh? Um, I don't know if you had a question here. If often misdiagnosed, idiopathic, and remains unresponsive to HBP needs or meds, to be clear, I'm not a medical professional. I just read, I think I am learning, is that when we refer to repeating patterns of multi-generational cycles of trauma, it may well often be not only the brain, but also the adrenal glands, Oh, I thought I cut you off, but I didn't. Good. The adrenal glands are pushed way beyond their natural tolerant limits, resulting in continuing mental, emotional, and medical trauma throughout life. The stress of it all. Yeah, because we're not eliminating the stress. Mom and dad just keeps doing it and doing it and doing it. Dad goes to work. Mom gets drunk, go to bed. They come home, they fight. They hit me. They call me names. They just ignore me. And this abundant abundance of stress is killing us. And it can kill us in many different ways. But this makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. I think my last answer to the last question might help you more. Um, as these unfortunate souls still remain in almost constant state of terror, it is very difficult to get them to go out on a limb to get help. Yeah, th this is condition, right? We, we never had help. We don't, we don't have enough self-worth to ask for it. Shame causes low self-worth. Not getting what I need is shame. Neglect and abuse is shame. I'm not going to go get the help I need. I'm not worthy of it. This is normal. Some people think that everyone is anxious all the time. They don't realize that it's, no, we're not. Sad. That's just why help is just getting the right help is imperative. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, David. William from Alberta, Canada here. Hope you are well. I am. Thank you. Hope you are well too, William. I've gotten a place, I've gotten to a place in my healing journey where I can go multiple days or even weeks without thinking a lot about my BPDX and the hurt she caused me. The sudden something, this, then suddenly something will happen that triggers those negative emotions and thoughts to come back in full force again for a certain period of time. Some examples of what triggers that for me is her showing up in my dreams, seeing her in public or seeing, hearing something that reminds me of her and our relationship, is the backsliding and having days or weeks where you really struggle still just a part of the healing process? Sure, why wouldn't it be? Life isn't linear. You think healing from trauma is? Nope. You know, no one lives like this. Everyone's up and down, good days, bad days, but we're unstable. See that? That's how we are right now. We need to stabilize. That's why I was saying earlier, when I help clients, we have to eliminate stress and start to stabilize. Um, you know, your memories will attach or your brain will attach experiences, memories to other things. But don't worry too much if we're still triggered. It doesn't mean you're not healed or healing because we're really talking about trauma. I can heal for many years about, you know, a, a gunshot or shots firing at people and someone getting shot and dying like war. And I can heal from it, feel better about it, not get scared anymore. And all of a sudden there's a gunshot and I hit the floor. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm not healed from it, but you're still getting triggers. And usually what, ha what helps is just opening things like this up, not ignoring them. If you had help last year, with a professional and you stop, maybe go back for a session or two and talk about this. The things that the, the, the things that you know trigger this, 
expose yourself to it more. Your brain cares more about the last experience we had. So if my last Christmas was really traumatic, this Christmas is going to be really scary. Until this Christmas, the next Christmas, the next Christmas, nothing bad happens. It's no longer traumatic or scary. I hope that helps. You're okay, William. This is very typical. Yeah. Hopefully this starts to go more down like this. We do that with professionals. Help us do that. Hi, David. Big fan from Ireland. Hello. I don't know your name. Sorry. I recently just ended a brief two months dating situation with a female who was 41, same age as myself. First incident, she stormed off in the street because a coworker said hello to us both and briefly chatted to me for a few moments as we walked towards the car park. Whew, that's not good. Just talk about work. I had to go find her and she states she felt unwanted by me and she just wants only my attention. This was after maybe two weeks of dating. I have a feeling you knew that wasn't right. Now you know for sure it's not right. Uh, you went on about another two instances where she gave you silent treatment, then argued as you went to a store. She wants everyone to know that you belong to her. These are just big signs of, of being, you know, um, clingy and, and needy and dependent and controlling. Gross. Gross, in two weeks. Oh my God, imagine two years. Oh. These relationships are very dangerous. These are the signs of the most dangerous relationships, by the way. Because these are reactions from everyone from borderline to psychopath. Psychopaths may not run away and freak out when your friend talks to you and stuff, but what she wants, how she wants it to be, is Ugh. um i don't know if you had a question and did i cut you off oh no i got it here my gut instinct wait your gut instinct was looking she was looking an easy target to get somewhere to live and it just felt far too clingy always touching me the mood swings the planting a vision of the future something just felt off and i walked away there's more Oh, I know there's more, but, but that's just a brief overview of the main parts. Am I correct in saying these are some pretty big red flags? <laughs> what bigger ones do you need? Like, shoot you? <laughs> well, if those aren't, what are? And I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I hope I'm not. I, I like to laugh at this stuff if we can. I'm laughing with you. I'm trying to get you to laugh at yourself a little bit and go, yeah, no kidding. Huh? How could I have asked that? Are these red flags? <laughs> How about a criminal history? Is that a red flag? I mean, what, what, what more do we need? And the red flags are emotional. How did this feel not comfortable stressful relationships are to provide comfort not happiness guys <laughs> that's up to you you want to go be happy go do something that makes you happy you want to leave that up to people or you think that's your job we're screwed comfort that's it life is stressful life is dangerous we're here together to provide it, to make it help it be a little bit more comfortable. That's it. That's it. Not happy. This is stressful. There's something wrong. So instead of always concentrating on how we feel about someone in two weeks, oh, they're so great, so pretty, fun. We concentrate on how they make us feel. Stressed, smothered, suffocated. That's the part that matters. Okay, big red flags. Well, we're all different. They are to me. <laughs> uh, leave us love, David. Oh, uh, love from North Cyprus. Can you advise me on compassion towards my ex-husband regardless of everything he put me through? I feel so sorry for him. I pity him. Thank you to 
to you. I have educated myself on NPD and I understand why people can end up as narcissists. I would never go back to that life. I'm so happy now. However, I do feel so bad for him. Such an awful existence. Can you talk about this? Well, sometimes we identify with people. That's what we gravitate towards, whatever we identify with. If I'm black, I'll probably gravitate more toward, towards the group of black people than the group of white people. I'll probably walk this way. If I'm a woman, maybe the group of women. I know some of you women are like, oh, hell no. <laughs> but we gravitate to what we identify with. That is a part of this element of bringing us two together. We each have some self-worth problems from being neglected and abused. A little low self-worth, a little bit, which means we don't have good boundaries. That's what boundaries means. It's a measure of our self-worth. See that? I feel sorry for him. You're the one suffering. There's suffering all around the world. Why so much with this person? It's close. I see it. That's me. I'm lonely. I'm hurt. I'm sad. I'm depressed. I didn't get what I needed. Neither did they. They're the same. You don't have to have a personality disorder to identify with someone that has a personality disorder. There's many things you can identify with. Hair color, gender, things like this. You feel sorry for him. Do you feel sorry for yourself? It's okay. Didn't you have a sad childhood, sad life too? I bet. Once you don't feel that way anymore, you won't identify with that anymore. We can have compassion for someone, but we don't have to feel sorry for everybody. Now that I look at homeless and say there's somewhat of a choice there, they can get a little help if they need it, they want it, there's some available. I have, I'm compassionate about for their situation, how they got there, but I don't wanna feel sorry and pity people anymore. And I don't wanna feel sorry for myself, I want to have self-compassion. So the best way to start with self-compassion with somebody else is to start having it for yourself. Did this person abuse you? Did this person hurt you? Did you suffer? Have some self-compassion. I have compassion for borderlines, narcissists, sociopaths and psychopaths, histrionics. I do. I know they suffer. I have a hell of a lot more compassion for every single person around them. Way more. Including me. Okay? We don't need pity. Screw pity. Go to up to a wheelchair. Someone in a wheelchair. Tell, they how, tell them how sorry you feel for that. See what happens. We, no, we don't want that, right? Some, few people like that. But we don't want it. So we try to change our way of thinking. We have compassion. You don't need to feel sorry for a grown adult that can get help if he wants it. If I don't go get the help I need, it's my choice. And we're different. And let me live my choice. Okay? You think that it's good for me to go get help. But maybe I don't. Who's right? Who's right? We don't tell people what to do. I can only know what's best for somebody if they tell me. I have to at least know what they need and want and how they feel, what they value, what they believe. I have to know these things really, really well to say, okay, according to all this, you should do that. But it'd be easier for them. That's why I leave it up to them. That's why I don't judge. That's why I don't control. That's why I don't care. He has made choices and this is what he wants. He'll tell you. So just accept it. You don't need to feel sorry. Everybody can heal from emotional pain and trauma. Everyone can heal. Narcissists, psychopaths, we can heal from trauma. I'm not saying make our, all our mental illness go away or in remission, but we can heal from trauma. If someone doesn't want to, let them. If someone doesn't want to get a promotion and a better job, let them. If someone doesn't want to dress better, let them. If someone doesn't want to lose weight, let them. If someone wants to not get help and keep being a piece of shit, let them. That's it. We have no control in our environment, people. We just be careful the environment that we choose, okay? I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I hope that helps. Can you let me know? Thank you. And the healing family from California. Hello, good to see you again. 
Another awesome video. Thank you. Thank you. My children and I have been in therapy for a few months already to heal from the discard, as you probably remember. Yes, I do. When you started to share with your therapist about all the weird, odd things that your fiance did, she asked you if you knew how dangerous these people are. She said to come up with an emergency plan for me and your children, for you and your children, pack a suitcase with important documents have a close, important person that you trust in case your children and you have an emergency due to him returning in an unsafe way. You got scared. The therapist said these people mostly tend to come back and sometimes wild and crazy. I told my therapist, I don't think he will try looking for us because he's full of shame. She said she's seen this for many, many years because she's an older therapist. We don't know what people will do. She's not saying she knows that he will do it. She's saying in patterns that she's seen that people have done this. You're just translating this to me. The way you're translating it, it could be totally accurate. Th that's not very good. It, it seems like it affected you. You know, but what, what is most important is how people feel. And so if you're scared, then we talk about what we can do about it. That's it. What we, when there's trauma, we can be much more scared. We develop phobias for our brain does to keep us safe. That's all our brain can do to keep us safe, right? Make us real, real scared. Make those stress chemicals go crazy. I have to tell my clients a lot. I'll have a, a woman who thinks that her husband of 18 years, now that they divorce, he's gonna come take her life. And I'll say, has he ever shown any violent, no, never. Has he ever hurt anyone? No. Has he ever threatened it? Said he's going to? Never. Nothing. Ever. Probably not. Literally. Probably not. What can we do? Be prepared. Just in case. We go over, I go over my clients over, you know, different emergency lights and, and alarm stickers and signs and, and get a dog and we do. There's a bunch of things that we can do. And then we feel safer and we know how we're going to react. So we don't have to think about it much. I'm sorry if your therapist made you more scared. Just be prepared in case something happens. If he is not like this, you haven't seen him like this. It doesn't make sense. Does it? No. It doesn't make sense that he's all of a sudden going to be like this now. I think you're right what you told the therapist. I hope that helps. It wouldn't hurt to just have some basic safety measures. I've made a video about it. Um, or you hire someone to help you, but um, I've offered to talk to you too. Lots of suggestions, lots of things you could do to feel safer. It's all, all that matters is how we feel. And we don't let our fears get carried away. When we have a fear, we say what that is and we be as precise as we can. What am I scared of? That he might come by. No, no, not that he might come by. What's wrong if he might come by? He might, okay, don't answer the door. Not too scary, right? Oh no, it'll make me, huh? I know, to the point where it's always coming up here and now you think that he's gonna barge in the door with a shotgun. Well, he's not like that, probably not gonna happen, right? But we can be somewhat prepared for things. Think about things that you can do to prepare yourself to feel safer. That's all. Um, dog Culture Review asks me to please address the narcissism of dog culture. I had no idea what they were talking about. So they replied and said, for example, in our modern society, parents put dogs before kids. Uh, no, they don't. You can find me an exception. Sure. I bet there is somebody that puts their dogs before their children. But you just said modern society. That's just not true at all. I disagree. Uh, putting kids like second class citizens, not society. Few parents. Forcing them to suppress their emotions and limit their play for the sake of a dog. That's emotional abuse, neglect, and it's few. It's not most or all society and marketing uses words like man's best friends fur daddy 
And we say that people can raise dogs, but that takes value from raising a child. Parents tell kids it is their fault when a dog bites. I don't know whose parents did that. And parents expect kids to learn the signs of a dog attack. Yet parents themselves cannot prevent the attack. Not really sure where that is going. Um, okay, so there are parents out there that give the pets more emotional attention than children. Absolutely. I agree with you. I don't know how many. But I definitely wouldn't use, use words like modern society and just parents do this. Some. Did that happen to you? If it did, you can share a personal experience. If you had a question about this, you just wanted me to explain this phenomenon. And there's all forms of, of neglect. I, I can care more about my work than my kids. I can care more, more about my house than my kids. I can put things before my children when we don't. It's the only time we put our children before ourselves is when they're children, our children. And so that's neglect. There's all kinds of different forms. And yes, it does happen. What I've noticed about people that tend to isolate, don't have relationships with humans, but have lots of pets. And then they'll start telling you that I trust pets more and I love pets more. Pets are better than humans. That's severe depression. And it will not serve you at all. It's just your brain has taken over and it's trying to keep you safe. And it says dogs are safe, humans aren't. That's not good. And if we follow through and live like that, oh, it's going to be bad. It's already bad. It's going to get worse. That's when our mental health declines. Dogs are great. I recommend dogs for healing. I think I did earlier in this video. Helps raise oxytocin. We look in their eyes and we pet them. It's good for us for healing. It's good for anybody anytime. It's a good thing to have in our lives, pets. But people that put pets before humans are depressed. Why? Because here's society, all of us. And if you get out of society, you get depressed. That's why people who are extreme and ideologies are depressed. They're not in society. And what do people in extreme ideologies say? The world's going to shit. It's all bad. People are bad. Watch out. Bad, bad, bad. Well, include yourself in that. If you're going to talk about all people, don't exclude just you. Um, and if I think that humans are bad and I love just cats, you're depressed and it's not going to get better until we learn how to have relationships with people. People that give up on people have given up on themselves because nobody else is suffering except you. And if that was, if that's in all of us innately in all of us, then we wouldn't be alive today. There'd be no human beings on this planet. We need each other. I don't know what else you're asking me. Can you please um, ask me something else about that? Because I don't even know if I answered your question. But thank you. Mercedes from Maine here. Hello, Mercedes. I have a question for you. Is making empty promises a common habit for people diagnosed with BPD? And what are your thoughts on why they engage in it? Okay. So you're talking about impulsivity and stuff. Sure. A big part of who we are is what we value. I put morals first and belongings and things last. But we all have a value list. And people will tell you what they value when they talk about money all the time and how much things cost. That's what they value. Something I value is integrity. I believe it's all we really truly have. If I don't have my word, I have nothing. If I break your trust, I'm screwed. If you can't rely on me, I'm screwed. It's extremely valuable to me. Not in, just in others, but myself. I must keep my word. I'm very conscious about it when I give my word. I don't just give it out easily just because someone wants me to. I think about it. And I even say no if I can't do it. But some people don't have much moral values. They'll say they do, they just don't know themselves. Don't have much of a moral compass, right? I wouldn't beat up somebody because they hurt my friend. 
Well, I thought hurting people is wrong. It is, but you just hurt them. I know because they got hurt them, but you just said hurting people is wrong. Well, no, it's okay. So hurting people is okay. Yeah. Well, why did you hurt someone? Be Your friend got hurt. You didn't like that. I thought it's okay. Well, no, it's not okay to hurt someone. Okay. Then why did you hurt someone? Because they hurt someone. Well, you just do this all day. Yeah. Who's on first? So we're all different. And the first rule to understand when we interact with people and especially allowing them into our life is our values have to match and not everyone's does. And so you have a group, a percentage. I don't know what that percentage is, but there's a percentage of people that do not have moral values and don't give a shit about them. But that percentage can be split into two groups. Someone that knows that they don't have moral value and doesn't care like a psychopath and then you have a borderline and a narcissist who pretends they have more value, so they think they do, and they don't realize that they don't keep their word, that they lie. They rationalize, justify, remember, don't look at themselves, don't change anything, and they keep doing it and doing it and doing it. If you value integrity, then everybody in your life must value it too. If you don't, because we take our values, we plant them into the ground, and we make them principle, and everything we do, we best shows who we are and that we value these things. But if you don't keep your word, you just picked up your morals and moved them out of the way. You have loose morals. We feel unstable now. If I allow someone into my life that doesn't value what I value, I have to pick them up, move them out of the way too. Feel unstable now. It gets easier and easier to do it. So if you value integrity, you can only have people in your life that value it as well. And that takes a long time to see, to find out. So we don't commit. We don't let people in our life. We don't go fast. We try not to attach until we find out that they value integrity and everything else that you value as well. And there's people out there that'll tell you they value integrity. There's people out there that will believe they value integrity and they'll never keep their word and they don't understand and they don't change that. So we're all different. Yeah. And some people don't know that. <laughs> uh, I think we're getting close to done. Peter, don't know where you're from. Let us know where you're from next time. Do you think it's possible to be, do you think it's possible, possible to be such a, let's call it simp, that you literally train your partner to be PPD, even if they aren't BPD? Well, if you're asking me, can you, can you make someone have a personality disorder in adulthood? No. If you're asking me, can you make someone display similar behaviors? Sure. You ask me, are there personality disorders that are a bit different than BPD, but ultimately bring these qualities out in others? All 10 personality disorders are different and all have a very specific diagnostic criteria. However, there's so much overlap that once you cross the threshold, once you cross the line, once you have a PD, you could have traits of all 10. One most important that I've always noticed is no matter what personality disorder you have, you're also higher in narcissism. You have narcissistic personality disorder traits, maybe not the diagnosis, but you're higher on the spectrum. So, yes. Hope I answered your question. Please let me know, Peter. Thank you. And that's it. I was right. We are done. I don't know how long that was. Oh, shorter than I thought. I wanted it under an hour, for under 45 minutes. Um, let me know what you guys think of my answers. Please share your own experiences for other people watching the video. It really helps them learn and be validated and keep asking questions. If you feel this is beneficial, what I'm doing here, support it with a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share it with someone else, ask questions. Thank you guys. Don't forget this week and forever, love yourself first. I'll see you next Monday.